session of Pausa Ivy Met virtual visiting, visiting professor. Today we have uh, Dr. Mahum Haider, who is a urologist, will talk to us about surgical and non-surgical management of BPH. And I think it's a very good topic that doesn't suffer the same disparities like in prostate cancer or other diseases that are related to race. So I think it's something that is uh, a concern for us due to the high number of uh, BPH in our practice. So uh, Dr. Mahum, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you everybody for participating. Um, I apologize in advance for my ignorance. I'm sure that the practice patterns and the patient populations that you all manage will be very different from what I'll be talking about today. So hopefully this will be um, as relevant as possible. Um, the, as Mohammed said, the incidence of BPH is so high. It's estimated here in the United States that about 50% of men over 50 have some degree of BPH and it only gets more, progress, more progressive with age. So I wanted to talk about both the surgical and the non-surgical management options and just share some of the data behind those different treatment options with you all. Um, and so feel free to stop me at any time if you have comments along the way. Um, there should also be plenty of time at the end for a discussion. So just because the terms that we use to talk about BPH can vary from region to region, I'm just gonna go over the acronyms that I'll be using in the talk so that that makes sense going forward. And then I'll talk a little bit about how I work up lower urinary tract symptoms in BPH, understanding that the, the resources and the equipment used to do that type of workup can be quite different. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the different treatment algorithms that I use in uh, surgical decision making, um, some of the data behind the different treatment options, and I'll touch on some of the newer technologies that are on the market now for BPH treatment. So BPH, you know, that's the term we're all familiar with, benign prostatic hyperplasia. Technically, that's a histologic diagnosis that can only really be made after someone's had a biopsy showing that they don't have cancer. But at least here in the United States, we use that term interchangeably with prostatic enlargement. Um, so it doesn't imply necessarily that there's no cancer. The technical term, correct term to use is BPE, benign prostatic enlargement, which is just a clinical diagnosis you can make with a rectal exam. LUTs or lower urinary tract symptoms are, it's basically an umbrella term that we use to describe all kinds of irritative urinary or irritative or obstructive urinary symptoms. Truss is transrectal ultrasound. Sometimes we'll have a truss volume on a patient who's had a prostate biopsy before, which gives us a good sense of how large their gland is. But for most patients that we're seeing for BPH alone, we don't typically have a truss volume. What we do have is the digital rectal exam or DRE, which we do in the clinic to get a sense of how large the prostate is. AUR is acute urinary retention, GH, gross hematuria, and PVR is post void residual. And most practices here have a uh, bedside bladder scanner that we use to get a post void residual, but in the absence of that, it can be obtained you know, just by uh, straight catheterization. So in the initial workup, um, I really try to make an effort to tease out the obstructive versus irritative symptoms uh, and how bothersome they are to the patient during the history taking. Um, and this is important because obviously it affects the type of treatment path we go down, depending on what's bothering them more. Um, and then in terms of the past medical history, there are several comorbidities that have a direct effect on urinary symptoms. And some of the ones that we see very commonly in the United States are obstructive sleep apnea, CHF, congestive heart failure, obesity, and diabetes. And unfortunately, those numbers are all going up for us. Um, but it's important to tease this out because I've had a few patients come in with nocturia anywhere between three to six times a night, and it's just making them miserable. And they have untreated sleep apnea. And once they start putting their mask on at night, in some cases, their nocturia has resolved with that alone. And in other cases, it's gone down significantly. So just an easy thing to uh, ask about. And then I will go into behavioral contributors um, to ask them about their fluid intake, timing of fluid intake, medications, particularly diuretics, and what time they take those. Uh, and then as far as their urological history goes, I'll ask about any 
uh, specific events of bladder stones, recurrent UTIs, obstructive nef nephropathy, gross hematuria, or a rising PVR, because those things will kind of push me towards more uh, surgical intervention up front. And then in terms of their physical exam, I always do a rectal exam just to get a baseline sense of their prostate. Um, and then the AUA, the American Neurologic Association, actually has a set of guidelines on the initial workup of the patient with BPH. And part of that standard initial workup is a urinalysis. So pretty much everybody gets that. Typically, they'll get it before they're even referred to see a urologist. Um, one thing that I really find very helpful and informative is avoiding diary. Um, and I use this particularly for patients who have mostly irritative symptoms. Um, there is a really nice template on the Urology Care Foundation website that I just print out and hand to them, and it just has them keep a log of all of their fluid intake and all of their urine output for a 48-hour period. And this has been both diagnostic and therapeutic. In some cases, I've had um, some younger men come in who are bothered by frequency, and they say they're going to the bathroom all day, and they just can't get anything done. And when they complete their voiding diary, it shows that they're going to the bathroom you know, five or six times during the day, which is actually not that abnormal. And once they see that on paper, I think they're a bit reassured by that. And they're like, okay, I guess it's not as bad as I thought. Or it'll reveal someone who's drinking a six pack of soda a day and they're bothered by frequency. And so there's a lot of things that I can tease out from that to address their symptoms without medications or surgery. Um, we do have a uh, flow, flow meter and uh, the PVR machine in the clinic. So I like to do a baseline flow rate assessment and PVR, um, partly as a baseline assessment and partly to see uh, what kind of improvement they have with the different treatment options that we might go down. Um, and I know that that might not be available everywhere. Um, PSA, I don't do this regularly unless the patient is in the prostate cancer screening age range, in which case I'll have a discussion with them about the risks and benefits. Um, I typically will get a PSA on somebody who is going to be taking a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor just to have a baseline because I know that number will change once they're on the medication. And then the International Prostate Symptom Score, or IPSS, this is pretty widely used um, in the United States, and it's a great baseline assessment of the symptoms and the degree of bother the patient has. And I typically will do this before and after different treatment options to see if there's some subjective change um, in the patient's perception of their symptoms. So then as far as the decision to treat goes, for me at least, this is mainly based on the degree of bother or how those symptoms affect the patient's quality of life. I've had some patients who have scored very highly on the IPSS score with lots of frequency, urgency, nocturia, but they're not bothered by it. And so I don't necessarily push them towards treatment unless they have any of the absolute indications, which as you know, include obstructive nephropathy, uh, complications of chronic retention, like stone formation, recurrent UTIs, or problematic gross hematuria coming from the prostate. So if they have any of those things, we'll, I'll usually encourage getting treated up front. As far as choosing from the different treatment options, I, I try to do the least invasive thing first and then progress along that spectrum based on how patients respond. Behavioral changes in the receptive and committed patient can be very effective um, and very cost effective, obviously, because they don't cost anything. Uh, medical therapy, as we know, there are some very effective medications on the market now. Um, I would consider surgery a first-line option for patients who uh, don't want to be on a lifelong medication or for uh, patients who just want a quicker fix than medical therapy. And so I'll go into more detail with the different minimally invasive options we have. Um, but as far as choosing between those options, a lot of it just depends on the patient's preference what the cause of their symptoms is. Is it an obstructive prostate or is it an overactive bladder? Um, and then their prostate size and PVR kind of help choose between the different uh, options as well. So I won't dwell on behavioral therapy for too long, but just to mention this briefly, 
Um, some of the common recommendations I'll give patients, particularly if they have nocturia or uh, urgency frequency, is restriction of their fluids two hours before bedtime. There are patients who are accustomed to having a glass of tea or a glass of wine before bed, and that's a pretty easy thing to modify. Um, I tell them to reduce their caffeine and alcohol intake, particularly in the evenings. And if they're on diuretic medications, if it's safe to do so from a medical standpoint, I'll have them take those earlier in the day. Double voiding is something a lot of patients will do intuitively anyway because they realize they just need a little more time to empty their bladders. Um, bladder retraining is a little less intuitive, but um, I have a handout that I'll give to patients who mostly have urgency frequency without excessive fluid intake. And it, it's kind of like physical therapy or rehab for the bladder where they are taken through a guided sequence of exercises to improve their bladder capacity. And um, I tell them that it's like any exercise. You have to be consistent if you want it to work, but it can be very effective. And then if they do have any comorbidities like sleep apnea or diabetes, I encourage them to see their primary care doctor and just optimize the treatment for those because it will impact their urinary symptoms as well. So when thinking about medical therapy, I usually consider the ideal candidate to be someone who is bothered by their symptoms enough that it affects their quality of life, but who doesn't have any absolute indications for surgery. And I'll go through each of these different medical options in a little more detail. So alpha blockers, I think, probably are the most commonly used medication. Certainly in the United States, they are. Um, and the MTOP study, the Medical Treatment of Prostate Symptoms study, uh, was published back in 2003. And they did a really nice job of looking at the treatment of BPH with an alpha blocker alone versus a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor alone versus a combination of the two. And it showed that patients who were on just an alpha blocker had um, a reduction in the clinical progression of their BPH by 39%. Um, it did not reduce their risk of developing acute urinary retention or the need for surgery down the line, but it did significantly improve the flow rate and quality of life. And that improvement, even anecdotally, I can tell you most patients will notice that within a few days, if not a couple of weeks within starting the medication. The side effect profile is pretty low, um, but because of the smooth muscle relaxation, there can be some orthostatic hypotension, uh, dizziness or asthenia. So we typically tell patients to take this at night, right, right before they go to bed. Um, retrograde ejaculation is pretty common. And for older patients, that's not of much consequence, but for someone who wants to maintain fertility or is interested in having biological children, it can be a big deal. So I always just mention that to them. And then the main contraindication is anyone who's going to be getting cataract surgery. Um, if they're on an alpha blocker, they can develop intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. And that's been shown to happen even years after they've taken an alpha blocker. So if you have a patient who's going to get cataract surgery, it's best not to put them on this medication. But between the different agents, tamsulosin, terazosin, doxazosin, they've all been shown to have comparable efficacy. Tamsulosin is the most selective, so it has a better side effect profile, um, but they all work pretty well. So 5-alpha reductase inhibitors work a little bit differently because they affect the hormone axis, um, but monotherapy with dutasteride in the mTOPS trial was shown to also reduce the clinical progression of BPH by about 34%. This actually did reduce the risk of acute urinary retention, and it reduced the need for surgery down the line. And because it reduces prostate volume by 20% in six months, it's very effective for large prostates. That 20% makes up a you know, pretty significant amount of tissue. Um, it's also been shown to reduce hematuria. And so in many practices here, for patients who have some hematuria that keeps prompting a hematuria workup, they'll get started on finasteride. Although that data came from a study that looked at the effect of finasteride on post-TERP hematuria specifically. Um, so it may be a little more selective than we think, but it, it's used pretty widely. Um, side effect profile, again, is pretty well tolerated, but in less than 5% of men, there can be some sexual side effects, decreased libido, erectile dysfunction. Fortunately, those are all reversible. So if the patient's bothered by that, they can just stop taking the medication. 
The one really important thing that I tell any patient that's being started on this is um, the findings from the PIVOT trial where they treated men with uh, 5-alpha reductase inhibitor to see if it reduced the risk of prostate cancer. And over 20, 30, 20 years of follow-up, there was a significant reduction in the incidence of prostate cancer in the men who were in the treatment arm. However, the small percent of men who developed prostate cancer on the treatment arm tended to have a higher grade, which was a little bit confusing and hard to explain, but the theory was that by reducing the overall um, prostate volume, the yield of the prostate biopsy went up and just the sampling was better. So I usually tell patients it's not a reason not to take it, but it is a reason to check their PSA before and during treatment. Um, and if their PSA spikes at all, they should get a biopsy. And then finally, the, the most significant finding of the study was that combination therapy with an alpha blocker and a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor has an additive effect, and it reduced the clinical progression of VPH by 66%, which is pretty good. Um, again, because of the effect of 5-alpha reductase inhibitors on the volume, um, the ideal candidates for this are men who have large prostates um, or who are at a greater risk of progressing in their LETs. Um, but it's been shown to significantly reduce uh, flow rates and symptom scores compared to monotherapy. So it's a good option. So those are basically treatment options for patients who are majority dealing with an obstructive component. For patients who have more of an overactive bladder picture, uh, anticholinergics are the first line treatment that we use. Um, they decrease urgency, frequency, and incontinence by reducing the involuntary bladder contractions. And they can be used in combination with the other medications for patients who have an enlarged prostate, as long as they don't have an elevated PBR, uh, recurrent UTIs, or if they're of advanced age. Um, I typically don't give anticholinergics to men over 80 because of the cognitive side effects. Um, and for men between 75 and 80, I usually give a pretty low dose. Um, the side effects, unfortunately, can be quite prohibitive with anticholinergics. The more benign side effects, like constipation, dry eyes, and dry mouth, can be so severe that some patients choose to just live with their urinary symptoms rather than deal with that. But the cognitive side effects are really the ones that I worry about more, um, and they're more pronounced in el elderly patients. So it's not a great option for the older patient with OAB. Fortunately, um, an alternative was introduced in 2012. Mira Begron works a little bit differently. It's a beta-3 agonist, and so it stimulates the beta-3 receptors on the detrusor, and by doing that, enhances bladder relaxation during the filling phase and increases bladder capacity. And it doesn't have any of the anticholinergic side effects. Um, unfortunately, it is quite expensive. And the out-of-pocket cost can be prohibitive for many patients in my practice anyway. And a lot of insurance companies are not keen to uh, cover it. So it's a little bit limited in its availability, but it is pretty effective. So moving on to surgical therapy, um, I consider this for anyone who wants a quick fix or has any um, absolute indications. Um, there are a lot of really effective, minimally invasive procedures now. Um, I'll talk about a couple of the in-office procedures, uh, and then we're all familiar with the transurethral procedures that are done in the operating room. Um, I'll touch briefly on the robot-assisted prostatectomies, and I don't need to tell anyone in this audience about open, simple prostatectomies. You all could probably teach me a lot about that. So Urolift was the first in-office procedure marketed for BPH treatment. It is FDA approved and part of the AUA guidelines in the United States for BPH treatment. Um, it is not marketed as a replacement for TERP. It's marketed more as an intermediary between medical treatment and surgical treatment. And essentially it works by placing implants into the prostate uh, through a special cystoscopic device where one end of the implant gets anchored between the prostatic capsule and the other end is anchored to the lumen and it's almost like pulling curtains apart. So it doesn't remove any prostate tissue but it just mechanically opens the prostatic urethra. Um, 
the initial studies that were done on this were done on patients who had less than 80 cc glands and they excluded anybody who had a median lobe. So the patient profile was a little bit more limited, but they did subsequently publish um, a, a study that showed you can do it on patients with a median lobe by placing the implant at a 45 degree angle on the median lobe to kind of push it to one side. So they say that that's effective. I personally don't offer this in my practice only because I think if somebody is going to need something more than medication, I might as well do a more definitive surgery up front rather than do an additional expensive procedure that doesn't prevent future intervention. Um, but in any case, when compared to placebo, it has been shown to have a significant improvement, um, but it is not as effective as TERP. The advantages of this or some of the features that made it appealing were that it had less sexual and irritative side effects because there's, you're not creating this raw surface area in the prostatic urethra like you do with a TERP. There's less epithelial trauma, so less irritative symptoms and um, much lower risk of retrograde ejaculation. Over five years of follow-up, they showed that the initial improvement in the IPSS scores deteriorated a little bit, so it was not sustained for five years but quality of life scores were sustained. Um, and the retreatment rate over those five years was 13.6%, which um, I guess you can decide if that's high or low, depending on the fact that it's done in the office without any anesthesia, but I think that's a bit high. A newer in-office procedure is Resume, which basically uses water vapor therapy to treat the prostate. And essentially through their uh, cystoscopic device, a needle is discharged into the prostate tissue. And there's about a one centimeter radius on the steam that's injected. And all the tissue that comes into contact with the steam basically dies, dissolves, and gets reabsorbed by the body. And so there is an actual volume reduction in the prostate over time. Um, Five-year data was just recently published in April of this year. And they had shown that there was an approximately 50% improvement in the IPSS scores, the maximum flow rate, and the quality of life that was sustained over five years of follow-up. So very promising. The retreatment rates are much lower. It was 4.4% at five years. Um, and again, one of the main advantages was the lack of sexual side effects. The, the rate of retrograde ejaculation is about 3 to 6%. There's no de novo ED. Uh, according to the studies. And with both Eurolift and Resume, there was, a, there was a subset of patients that started taking medication again because they still were bothered by their symptoms. And that was similar. It was about 10 to 11% uh, for both procedures. Aquablation, I'm just going to mention this briefly because it's um, kind of a hot topic. Um, it's very new. It only recently has been done clinically uh, outside of the experimental setting. But essentially, it uses high pressure saline to hydro dissect the tissue. And in order to do that, you have to take some pretty precise measurements of the prostate using an ultrasound that's done at the time of treatment and the patient's under general anesthesia. And then using those measurements, the machine will then fire this high pressure saline into that calculated volume of prostate and ablate the tissue. Um, I, from what I understand, some of the initial challenges were uh, with treating the hematuria that resulted from this kind of treatment, because obviously during the aquablation, there's no coagulation. Um, but they have published one-year data showing that there is a similar improvement in the flow rate compared to a TERP, and the retreatment rate for that one year was 2.6%. So it's, it's promising, but I, I think there's probably still a few wrinkles to iron out before this becomes widely available. So the um, more well-established minimally invasive surgical therapies we're all familiar with, um, TERP is the gold standard. Low morbidity, especially now that saline is more commonly used than water, um, but does have a pretty high rate of retrograde ejaculation, which can be um, uh, prohibitive for some patients. Higher risk of bleeding, higher risk of strictures, but a very significant improvement in flow rate and IPSS. The retreatment rate is, is estimated to be about 1% per year. Um, and quality of life is pretty high after a TERP. And at least here, we typically will reserve TERPs for prostates that are less than 100 cc's. 
Um, it can be done in larger prostates, uh, especially if you do a staged approach and you tell the patient they're going to need more than one TERP to get all the tissue. Uh, one variation on the TERP that I'm a big fan of is the laser TERP. And there are a few different lasers available for this. The green light photo vaporization was very popular a few years ago. And I did do that with some good success, but I've pretty much transitioned now to the thulium laser. And the thulium is really nice because the uh, ablative effect it has on the tissue is a lot cleaner than the green light. So you can really see the tissue plane very well, and it's very fast. It's very good at controlling bleeding. Um, so there's minimal bleeding. Most patients don't need to be on continuous bladder irrigation. They don't need to spend a night in the hospital. They go home the same day. On a few occasions, I've taken the catheter out the same day as the surgery and sent patients home, and they've done well. Um, there is still a significant improvement in the flow rate, IPSS, and quality of life compared to TERP. Um, but again, it still has high uh, rates of retrograde ejaculation, about 65%. Um, there is a risk of stricture formation. And it's not suitable for very large glands just because it would really take a long time to laser treat a greater than 100 cc gland. Um, and the retreatment rate at four years is estimated to be about 12.8%, which again, you know, that might be on the higher side. So HOLEP is um, a procedure that's not done as widely as laser terps and, and uh, electrosurgical terps. And personally, I don't do it either, but I, you know, I think it's a wonderful option for patients who have really large glands. Um, the symptom improvement is comparable to a terp with lower bleeding risks and lower reoperation rate because you're reducing all of the tissue or removing all of the tissue. Um, there is a higher risk of bladder injury, and that is mostly a result of the morselator that's used. So initially, you use the laser to get between the plane or get into the plane between the adenoma and the capsule. And once you get into that plane, you just lift the adenoma off in this picture, kind of like you would take an orange off of its peel. Um, but then once you have these chunks of prostate adenoma in the bladder, you use a morselator to crush them up and suction them out. And there have been um, a few reports of accidentally morselating the bladder wall, which is you know, obviously a big complication. So that risk is a bit high. Um, it does have a steep learning curve, and that's probably why it's not used as commonly. But it's a very effective alternative to a simple prostatectomy for someone who's trained in doing it and has a much lower morbidity because you're not doing an intra-abdominal surgery. And this actually is suitable for pretty large glands. It's been done in two to 300 cc glands. Simple prostatectomy, um, I'm sure you all are, are very familiar with this. This used to be the typical way that BPH was managed. Um, the entire gland is enucleated, so retreatment rates are very low. Um, again, it's at least in the United States, it's reserved for glands that are over 100 cc's. Um, we have transitioned mostly to doing this using the robotic approach, uh, robot-assisted laparoscopic approach, um, but it's a great open surgery as well. Um, it has the most durable long-term outcomes of BPH treatments. Uh, with the robotic cases, there's typically a one to two day stay in the hospital with the open cases on average two to three days in the hospital. It does require general anesthesia for us. Um, there is more blood loss and the risk of incontinence is a little bit higher if you get just beyond the apex of the prostate, um, but a really nice option. And then just briefly, the, the one surgical option that we have for irritative symptoms is becoming pretty um, popular now, especially for patients who have neurogenic bladders. Um, but bladder Botox injections are offered to patients who don't respond to the medical therapies. And by injecting the Botox, you're essentially paralyzing the detrusor, which if it works too well can cause retention. And so patients are trained on performing self-catheterization before we do this in the event that they need to do that. Um, it doesn't last very long. So if someone responds well to it, they might get it every six or 12 months. Um, but it's a, a nice option for patients who don't respond to medical therapy. Expensive though. So um, just in summary, the treatment, in my view, is based mostly towards improving quality of life. So I try to target the symptoms that are bothering the patient the most. 
there are a lot of options to choose from, um, but the choice really is based on the risk benefit profile, um, what's available and what the, pre what the patient's preference is. But it's a very active area of innovation and research, so hopefully there's even more on the horizon. All right, I think if there's uh, any questions or comments, we can do that. Hey, thank you for the nice talk. And I have one first question here from the chat, uh, asking whether in your experience, the combination of an alpha blocker and plant extract does give better results than alpha blocking alone. In the face of irritative symptom or obstructive uh, disorders. The combination of an alpha blocker and plant extract? And yeah. You know, um, there are a lot of plant extracts and supplements on the market here that have been studied. And so far, none of the, none of the randomized controlled trials have shown a significant improvement with the plant extracts alone. But anecdotally, I've had patients who swear by them, who say that their symptoms have significantly improved. So um, one of the other important things with those studies was they didn't find any adverse effects. So there were no complications of taking those extracts. So I usually tell patients, if you feel like it's helping you, go ahead and take it. Um, we don't have the data to support that, but it's not probably hurting them either. Okay. So I have a question about the use of uh, ditropan. Do yeah. you use it alone or do you associate it with uh, alpha blocker? just to avoid uh, urinary retention? Um, it depends. So if the patient empties well and they have urgency frequency, then I, I use the uh, anticholinergic alone. If they have some like weak stream or some obstructive <laughs> symptoms they're able to empty, then I'll use it in, in combination to treat both the irritative and the obstructive symptoms. But I will always have them come back two weeks later to check a PVR to make sure they're not retaining more before I do the long-term treatment. I guess the same uh, uh, precaution will be taken when you use the Botox, or do you use the Botox after surgery? Or um, The Botox I typically have been using for patients who have um, overactive bladder in isolation. The patients who have an obstructive component, I, I treat the obstructive component first. And if after treating that, they still have irritative symptoms, then I'll do the Botox. And in this case, do you, uh, like in the case where you have uh, the combination of obstructive and irritative syndrome and, and, and you feel like you need to do the surgery, how do you consider them regarding the chances of remaining uh, uh, irritative syndrome post-op? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I tell them that a lot of times the irritative symptoms are a result of the obstruction. And in many cases, once you relieve the obstruction, the irritative symptoms improve. That can take a few months, but it, it does happen most of the time. In the short-term period, I tell them that the irritative symptoms will be worse before they get better, just because they've had surgery on that area, it's going to be irritated. But the surgical side effect of increased irritative symptoms usually resolves by six weeks. After that, if they have an overactive bladder, that can take a, a couple, two, three months to resolve. If they still have symptoms after that, then I'll offer some additional treatment for the irritative symptoms. Okay, thank you. And how about the aqua, aqua ablation? Uh, once you have the specimen released, do you also use a morselator or how do you bring the so, specimen up? You know, I haven't done it. Um, it's still pretty new, but from what I've read, it sounds like the tissue is actually ablated at the time. It's not just resected. So there's no tissue to remove, but what happens is I think it takes like three minutes or some three to five minutes to aquablate the tissue. And then you have to go in and coagulate the prostatic capsule. That can take an hour. <laughs> yeah. Is there any other question from the floor? While you're thinking, I have uh, one more question. You've been to Africa many times, and I, I know you know the setting, you know what we have, how we manage between open prostatectomy and TERP. If you were to, would you, like, would you suggest any other techniques uh, 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 among those you described, like you know, leave to resume aquablation, if you take into account the economic impact, the, the setting that we have, or 
what would be your advice? I think cost is probably one of the big limiting factors, not just the cost of doing the surgery, but the cost of maintaining all of that equipment. Um, if there were a more cost effective alternative, I think it would be great to offer minimally invasive surgery to these patients. But given some of the um, resource settings that I've seen, I think as facile as you all are at simple prostatectomy, I think it's a great option. It's, you're very quick at it, it takes two, two hours or so. Um, it has long-term benefits. They typically don't need to be treated again. So I think in that setting, a, a simple prostatectomy is probably the most cost-effective. Thank you. We have Professor Nya in the floor. Professor Nya, do you have some comments? Yes, how are you? It was a very nice uh, talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was asking, what do you do? You, you do some uh, bipolar enucleation. You know, sometimes you can do bipolar enucleation. We have bipolar machine. It's easier for us to do bipolar enucleation mm -hmm. without any any more selector. You know, you can only do the you can do the enucleation and in the blood and neck use uh, the use your loops and do the normal resection. I think in Africa it's a better deal between uh, because laser is very expensive, and in our hospital we have we all have a bipolar bipolar machine. Yeah, I am very partial to the bipolar. Um, I've done the TERPs with both the monopolar and the bipolar, and I think the bipolar is just much, much nicer. Um, that is one of the more common procedures that I do. I think it's a great alternative. It's a little bit limiting only for patients who have the very, very large prostates um, because it's hard to get that all out in a reasonable amount of time. But if you have bipolar available, I think that's the, that would be my first choice. The other great benefit of the bipolar is you're using saline. So the TUR syndrome is a thing of the past. Um, so we use yes, yes, we can start with you have bipolar, it's really very nice for us. Yeah, and we don't use the morselator with that either, um, because the chips that are created with the loop are small enough that we just irrigate them out through the resectoscope sheath. Um, we don't enucleate the prostate with the bipolar because we only have the loop, so we resect. And so there is a little bit of prostate tissue remaining after the procedure, uh, but you're usually able to get a very nice open channel. Yes. Do, do you have some preference with alpha blockers? I, 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 I have, because we have less time. Do you think so? Dr. Fuda, please, can you stop your mic? Sorry, I didn't catch all of that. Could you repeat the question? Do you have some preference with alpha blockers, psilodosine or, or tamzilosine? Uh, I, I prefer, if I have, to start with psilodosine because I think we have less side effects than the others. Uh, what do you think about this? I agree with you completely. Um, I was using tamsulosin as my first line, but psilodosin actually has been shown to have an even better side effect profile. So here we have all these you know, restrictions with insurance coverage of certain medications. So sometimes tamsulosin is the only one that's covered, but I agree with you, if psilodosin is available, that's uh, even more selective. What, what do you think about uh, sal palmito, about phytotherapy? Yeah, I have patients who take it and they are convinced that it improves their symptoms. This, I've looked at the studies and they have not shown any adverse effect of those uh, supplements. They also have not shown any statistically significant improvement in flow rate or retention. But because they're not bothered, I, I don't tell people not to take it. I just don't prescribe it because I have to support it. And they don't need a prescription here. So if they want to take it, I'm fine with that. Okay. I think if Artemisia work with COVID, maybe the plant will come back on the ground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. We have a, a Professor Enwofo, who is the Pausa president. 
can we have a uh, professor and wolfo say a word is he's muted for now please yeah ladies and gentlemen i thank you once again i was a bit late because i had some work but i'm happy to be a part of you and i had part of the later parts of the lecture they are quite interesting and um well currently we are not into such good practice but i hope that as we acquire things we are going to introduce them into our practice so i welcome everybody on board thank you thank you so much for having me it's an honor um Thank you. It's an honor to, to talk about some of the stuff that's on the horizon. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I know we have, yeah, yeah, Professor. Well, it's, it's quite interesting. The, a lot of, in fact, we're all over Africa right now. I don't think we are too backward now. Most people are doing endoscopic uh, resections, all the different types. And uh, we are seeing to the benefits as well as in the complications. And then this issue of um, OAB is actually quite disturbing at times. Mm -hmm. Because when you have finished your proper surgery, the patient will still come down with some of these symptoms. And then uh, one is left in between trying different alternatives. And um, while well, with this, um botox injection which is going i believe will become available to everybody soon well i think the future is quite nice so we'll key into that mm -hmm. as soon as is possible thank you thank you yeah. thank you professor we have yes. one more question here is there a role for euroflowmetry post bpa treatment is there a role for your flometry in, in what? After BPA treatment, I guess after oh. surgery. Yeah, I use it regularly after treatment to partly to prove to myself that I did something, but it's, it's kind of nice to track the patient's improvement over time. And because I know that the retreatment rates are not zero, I typically will, after I do any kind of surgery, I'll have them come in and do a Euroflow and a PBR in three months and then six months, and then annually after that. And I know that's not a, a feasible strategy in some parts of the world where patients, you know, might not be very easy for them to keep coming back to the hospital, but for our population, that tends to work. And over, you know, two to three years, sometimes you do start to see a, a slowing of their stream or just more symptoms, and then you know you need to do something. That's great. Yeah, I think uh, above all, Dr. Mahum Haider is uh, uh, MPH, by the way. She is very involved in, uh, very interested in uh, system development and improvement. I think within Pauda, it would be good to do a kind of survey to see how patients are managed overall. That will give us an insight, replace uh, the role of plants and also all the available uh, treatment mod modalities. Something that is important to put on a paper to see how things can be uh, improved by discussing internally and also by where needed, find help from others in, in terms of collaboration. Yeah. That would be fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Any other question from the floor? Yes, Mohammed. Yeah, Professor Loy. Hello. Hi. I'm, I would like to say thank you for this nice presentation. And um, I have one comment about your conclusion. Has your takes your takes on message to about um, the innovative research in this field? My question is: since we know that Halep and um, TRP are giving very best results in terms of efficacy and long-term efficacy. What do you think about all those conservative therapy in terms of how we can apply them? Uh, how do you use it in your recommendation? Um, in what indication 
are they really helpful? Yeah. And my second, yes, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. And my second question is about uh, when you do a um, TRP for a patient who is like 50 years old or 55 years old, and then the pathology come, turned out to be a prostate cancer. Usually, what are your, uh, your next step after that uh, diagnosis of prostate cancer? And uh, how are the results after the treatment compared to those who never had to get the, the TRP treatment? Is it like, is it worse for continents or is it the same thing? Um, great questions. The first question, um, if I understand correctly, you're asking why would you use conservative therapy when something as effective as HOLEP exists? Am I understanding the question? Um, if like what, what, are, what, what is your position about this conservative treatment since we have very uh, good treatment like HOLEP and uh, TRP? Yeah. Um, so I think that a lot of it comes down to patient preference and the risk benefit ratio. Um, there are patients who are not terribly bothered by their symptoms. And if I do a TERP, they may have some complication of the TERP. Um, they may, you know, I've never had this happen, fortunately, but incontinence is one of those potential complications. So for someone who's not terribly bothered to begin with, I don't think it's worth taking the risk. And so I think that is the ideal situation for conservative therapy, like medication or behavioral therapy. If they're very bothered by their symptoms, then it's worth doing something a little bit more aggressive or more invasive. I think HOLIP is superior to TERP, um, but frankly, not a lot of us are trained in HOLIP. Personally, I've never even seen a HOLIP because nobody at my institution did it. And the learning curve is very high. So I wouldn't recommend having a HOLIP done by someone who's not very good at it. And the providers who offer HOLIP, there's just not very many of them. So I think that's why it's just not done as commonly. Um, so that's to the first question. To the second question, um, with you know, we've been doing the laser treatments more frequently now, and one of the drawbacks of that is that we don't have any tissue to get a pathologic diagnosis on. But I have had a few patients who had a bipolar TERP and there was some cancer in the chips. Typically, if we see that, then we'll do a dedicated 12-core standard template biopsy after the surgery. And you know, all of these patients have had a rectal exam beforehand. So for the most part, they don't get diagnosed with really advanced prostate cancer. Um, I've had some low risk and intermediate risk prostate cancers diagnosed after the TERP. And I just go through the normal treatment algorithm with them. They can get active surveillance if they choose. They can get definitive treatment if they choose. Radiation is not limited by having a TERP. Surgery, if they've had a TERP, the surgical plane behind the prostate and the rectum can be a little bit more difficult to dissect, but it's still doable with good margins. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? And in terms of continence, the rate of incontinence is the same or it's, it's, same. it's worse? Or what do you no, it's, it hasn't been shown to be worse. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. Professor Enwofo? Yeah, there's no, no, there are no other, I don't think we yeah, have any other questions. Yeah. The only thing is just a little comment. Yeah. But at times, when you finish uh, a prostatectomy and there's a, you now find incidental CAP. Well, they will go through the normal standards, try and uh, define the nature of the CA, whether it's still confined or is distant and so on. That will advise the next treatment that you are going to go on to, and then the aggressiveness. So there's no straight jacket about it. It's just the same basis for treating um, a CAP that you even diagnosed um, 
kita atau fresh. Ya. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it was a very productive session. There was many night discussion and I and I know there is a lot to do because this is as I said at the beginning, this is one of the the type of disease that has the same profile in terms of numbers. Uh, the, the most determinant factor is the age, and there is no significant racial differences as to the numbers compared to prostate cancer. And it's something that we all have to, to, to deal with on a, on a regular basis. And, and, I, and I know we'll all experience the differences as we move with the acquisition of new technology and with evidence-based uh, facts that will lead us to better take care of the patient. So thank you, Dr. Mahum. And the last word will be from uh, Professor Enwafo. Yeah. Thank you so much. But before I conclude, the, um, you see, we see very large prostates, giant, pro giant prostates in our practice, unlike what you see in um, the more advanced uh, communities. So it puts an extra burden, you know, on people. And you may have to determine if you can really go once, if you are doing a, a top, or whether you do it in bits. And again, um, you know, the bigger the size, the more the challenges like hemorrhage and all the post up things that come with it. So these are peculiarities in um, our practice, which um, we know most of most times it's not the way it's written in paper. So with time, you develop your own protocol for managing such difficult situations. Um, Having said that, I want to thank everybody who really have taken time you know, to participate. It's not easy. And then we thank the IVM particularly for letting us into this partnership. And then we are quite grateful. And I'm quite happy with our members. I hope that other sessions, we are going to have more people who came. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Really, it's an honor. I appreciate it. Thank you, Maha. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And see you next time. See you next time. Have a good night, everybody. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coordinating all this. And yes. Looking forward for the next session. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.